Okay, so um, the first question I've received is if you are the sub on the subject of diseases and the entanglement of diseases in the spirit world, energies, curses, etc. And in regard to healing methods depending on the cause of the disease. Um, well, that's kind of um, a big issue to, uh, uh, to talk about. Um, in general, uh, what you see is that um, the lower energies are inspired to follow the higher energies. So if something is wrong on a higher level, uh, it tends to manifest itself or is reflected on a lower level. Um, so for instance, if I uh, neglect a certain uh, part of my being on an energetic level or on a spiritual level. So for instance, my second chakra or my desires, my needs, what I want. If I don't pay attention to that, um, then ultimately this lack of attention, this energetic weakness, which exists on a, on a level of personality, will manifest itself on a physical level. And I will start developing uh, problems in um, this part of the body so that ultimately you get lower back pain, uh, menstruation problems and things like this. Um, so in a way the uh, condition of the energetic body usually foreshadows a little bit the condition of the physical body and uh, that makes also diagnosing physical problems from a purely energetic perspective a little bit tricky. And because if you see something wrong with the energy body, that doesn't mean that it is already uh, uh, wrong on the physical level as well. But it does mean that in a matter of weeks to months to years, a problem is very likely to develop on a physical level. But that has to do also a lot with just the uh, state of the physical level. So if on a physical level the lower back is very healthy and the prostrate is very healthy and the bladder is very healthy, then um, a pr uh, dysfunction on the energy level will take a very long time to break down, in a way, the healthy structure of the physical body to manifest the problem. Um, so what you find is that uh, every body has certain weak points or certain vulnerable points. And often on these spots you, uh, you first notice when your energy body is imbalanced. And uh, oddly enough these vulnerable points are points where often the energy flow is very strong. So there's a very strong um, reflection of the health of the energy body in the physical body. So these are often areas where uh, you can have a lot of strength, but also a lot of weakness. It sounds almost like a paradox. Um, but for instance, if you have a lot of creative energy, a lot of creative power, uh, that will mean that the energy is very strong in the liver. Um, and uh, that allows you to create new things, to destroy old things, to reorganize the world around you. Um, but that also means that if somehow your energy body is disbalanced, immediately your liver will also be disbalanced because it is really reacting very strongly to that part of your energy body. And if the liver is disbalanced, your whole health and your metabolism will suffer from it. So it's very important if you um, want to diagnose yourself or somebody else to find out what is in a way the, the biggest portal uh, between the physical health and the, the energetical health. And one of the ways to do that is to, um, to look at the meridians. So in your meridians you have five elements which correspond also to different organs. Um, the water element corresponds to the, the brain and the central nervous system, uh, the kidneys and the bladder and the urinary tract. <laughs> The second element is the wood element, which corresponds to uh, the liver and the gallbladder. Uh, the third element is the fire element, which corresponds to the small intestine and the heart. Um, the fourth element is the earth element, which corresponds to um, 
the stomach, the pancreas and the spleen. And the fifth element is the metal element which corresponds to the lungs, the large intestine and to the bones. And <coughs> in every cycle, uh, if it's a normal healthy cycle, the water element will move fastest and it will slow down a little bit as it moves to the, uh, to the metal element. Um, but even if a person is completely healthy, it's very likely that one element will be the strongest, most energy will be collected in, that, uh, in those meridians. So this is kind of uh, reflecting the nature of the person. Are they a very mental uh, uh, um, or very sensitive? Then uh, if they're very mental, they think a lot and they're very sensitive people, then a lot of the energy will be in the water element. And the water element uh, can be unbalanced by courage and fear. Having too much fear is slowing it down. To having too much courage speeds it up too, far, too much. And having fear decreases sensitivity, having courage increases sensitivity. So for the second element, um, which is the uh, a wood element, um, you have to look at the, the um, in a way the creative impulse. And the creative impulse can be in a way indeed creative or destructive. And depending on the speed, uh, so uh, a high speed um, is often a, a creative impulse and a slow speed is a destructive impulse and um, often the wood element is a very good indicator of the health of the body of sickness because if a person is fighting a disease they in a way want to purify their body so the uh, speed of the wood meridians will be very slow to create a purification to fight out uh, to fight against the impurities in the body while if the body is healthy then the person goes into a more creative state a more outwardly directed state and often it can also be a sign of uh, depression if the wood energy is very very slow and wood energy has a lot to do with uh, indeed this balance between creative impulse and destructive impulse and especially people in western society have a problem with the destructive impulse because destruction is seen as, positive, as negative as bad as unhealthy and because of that, a lot of impurities start to gather in the body because yeah, you keep on accreting, gathering more and more without really purifying or harmonizing what, is, uh, what has been gathered. Um, the fire impulse has to do a lot with, uh, with faith, uh, with having confidence either in yourself or having confidence in others, in the world in general, in life in general. Um, so often a high level of confidence creates a high speed in the fire meridians, a low level of confidence creates a low speed in these uh, meridians. Um, then we move to the earth meridians. The earth meridians have to do a lot with acceptance or rejection. Uh, so it has to do a lot with openness. Um, do you accept what is going on around you? Do you listen to others? Or are you more stubborn, more resisting, more um, yeah, steadfast in a way? And also there, there needs to be a healthy balance between the meridians. And finally the metal meridians. Um, it's about how conservative or how um, revolutionary, how adaptive you are. Uh, so it's very much about structures. Are you willing to let go of your memories, of your emotional uh, states or your emotional attachments and if the answer is yes you're really willing to change yourself to become a new person to grow then there will be a high speed in these meridians and if you're more stable then there will be a lower speed in these meridians and there's uh, always what is true that there is there should be a balance so too much of one or the other is very unhealthy so for instance in the uh, metal meridians, if there's a very high speed there, the person is very likely to be insane or confused or psychotic um, because there is no stability to them, there's no structure to them. So always 
balance is very important and every person has their own level of balance. What is balanced to them might be different what is balanced to another person. That depends on the nature of the spirit, of the soul, of the personality who is using the body. Uh, but always if either something is too slow or too fast, there will be a certain tension in the meridians. There will be a certain strain, certain emptiness, certain pressure. Um, so the health of the meridians really shows you how balanced a person is and um, how strong their health is. And depending on the nature of the person, their life mission, if you, if you will, um, a certain set of um, uh, meridians will be stronger, a certain element will be dominant. So if you're, for instance, an artist, then probably the wood meridians will be dominant because you want to create. And if you yeah, want to learn things, then probably your water meridians will be dominant because you want to study, you want to learn, you want to integrate everything in your brain. Um, and yeah, if you're like a person who wants to lead, then probably yeah, it is all about confidence, having faith in yourself and in others. So the fire meridians will be very strong. And for instance, if you're uh, working a lot in, in very harsh environments, in very difficult environments where you need to adapt all the time, open and close to the right influences, be very selective. So often people in a very stressful position, they will have a very strong earth element which helps them to filter out what is good for them, what is bad for them. And people who work a lot on themselves are very busy with their personal process, their personal growth. For them the metal, uh, metal element will be the dominant element. And the dominant element is often the best reflection and also the organs connected to the dominant element are the best reflection of the general health of the, of the energetic body. Um, so diseases are a little bit of a, of a tricky thing because uh, diseases actually come in, in several variants. So sometimes a person will have a disease because um, we call it a disease, but it's basically an unbalance of the body. So it's a, a problem in the metabolism or a problem in the immune system. Um, so an imbalance, a hormonal imbalance, for instance, um, or uh, certain diseases like cancer. Um, they're really reflections of the imbalance, which is often existing in the energetic body, which then starts to manifest as an imbalance in the physical body and especially in cancer it is often due to uh, a too strict morality so in a way it may seem very unfair but people who have a very strict sense of morality like they want to be good and they want to be more than good they want to be perfect uh, they create a lot of stress and they create a lot of often anger towards their own selves because they see themselves as being not good, impure, not good enough, imperfect. And this stress and imbalance and aggression can translate itself into, uh, into cancer, which is basically a reflection of the war the person is having with themselves, with their own dark side. It turns into a war of the body against itself, which is a reflection of this spiritual combat which they're performing. Um, so those diseases have a very direct link to the energy body. They are just a manifestation of the of the imbalance on the on an energetic level, on which is then reflected on a physical level. Um, other diseases, which have to do with um, parasitical beings or symbiotic beings, like uh, fungi, yeast, bacteria, um, viruses. Um, they often affect parts of the body which have already been weakened. Um, so a weakened immune system is just in general a sign of stress and thinking too much. Um, but often a certain organ will already be weakened, so less able to heal itself, to balance itself. And those organs are affected more strongly by a disease. And so often the diseases and the viruses will settle in an organ which has already been overburdened or overused or overtaxed. 
so this is often a signal if a disease attacks a certain organ that that part of your being needs to rest more, needs to relax more, um, you shouldn't use it as much. Um, so this is often a very good signal function of already a long existing imbalance which is manifesting itself in the form of a disease which affects then a certain part of the body. Um, so, um, a third part of problem which can exist is basically through um, an energetic infection. So it's not so much that just the physical body is infected by, uh, by a pathogen, but the energetic body is infected by a pathogen. Uh, which can be uh, an unhealthy energy from another, from another person. Uh, it can be a spirit. And it's also possible that it's um, yeah, a very primitive being or uh, even a construct like a curse. Um, curses are very tricky things. I will go into them more in depth later. Uh, but something which we tend to pick up a lot are indeed unhealthy spirits from other people. Um, we tend to open up to people in a very general fashion, like, okay, gosh, I love my dog or my cat or my neighbor or my husband or my wife, and you are just open to them. And the same with family members, you tend to be open to brothers, sisters. This is kind of a natural openness to the entirety of their being. This is also the essence of love. Love is that you have a connection to somebody else and that you accept them as a whole being. You do not judge them like, okay, I like this about you, I don't like that about you. So you can be nice to me, but if you're not nice, you have to leave. So that's not love, that's using. Um, so it's often, un unfortunately, the people we love who are in the best position to harm us or to unbalance us um, by their own yeah, uh, problems which they have. Because, in a way, um, energetic problems can be infectious. Uh, so energy has the tendency to flow from high to low. So if I have a very high, strong, powerful energy, and I'm surrounded by people who have a much lower vibration, much lower energy, my energy will tend to flow out of me into them. Um, this is a natural process, just like water flows down because of gravity. In the same way, energy flows from high to low. And it doesn't mean that they're evil people or stealing my energy, but yeah, if I surround myself only by people of, with very low vibrations, it will be very taxing for my energetic body. So it is necessary to have a kind of a mix of people who are a little, little bit higher, a little bit lower, so you're also your energetic body, body gets nourished. Another way to do that, to nourish the energetic body, is to spend time in nature, uh, because nature has a much higher vibration than we humans do and because energy is streamed from high to low it will flow from the plants from the animals from the stones into your body and your body gets charged so you can charge other people again so in general having animals around or plants uh, is very good for your energetic health especially if you're in contact a lot with people who have lower vibrations um, another thing which can happen is not so much that you lose your energy, but that you pick up energies of other people. Um, this is usually neither good for you, neither good for them. So for instance, if I have a headache and then uh, I spend some time with my girlfriend and she picks up my headache and so now instead of just me having a headache, both of us have a headache. And because in a way the headache is mine to begin with and it's my energy which is somehow disrupted it is relatively easy for me to to get rid of my headache to change my headache my own life force has a transforming quality so it will change my energy and my headache will go away after a while but the energy she picks up cannot be transformed by her quite as easily so while my headache may be gone it will linger in her much longer and will in me and also for me it has a signal function like okay your seven, six seven chakras are in not in balance or you're thinking too much or your neck is in the wrong position or your blood flow is not going right in the head so for me it's, it has a function and I can use that to improve myself improve my life but the headache the other person is suffering 
which he picked up from me, has no function. So it is rather a, a pointless suffering, a useless suffering, which incurs that way. So if this happens, the best thing to do is just to try to return to sender. I try to um, imagine, uh, like a magnet, imagine the person who you might pick, have picked up this energy from, and they're like a magnet, because their energy attracts their own energy. So they can make contact with you, or you can make contact with them, and in a way, like a sponge, they suck out their own energy out of you, going back to them. It's return to sender, and the same, you should also re take back your energies, which might be affecting other people. And how this works is generally because we do not like pain. We do not like negative feelings, we do not like negative thoughts, we do not like negative emotions. And everything we dislike, we try to push as far away from us as possible. We try to get rid of it. And um, if we are alone in our own bubble universe, there's nowhere to put it except ourselves. We have to accept it, we have to confront it, we have to work through it, we have to transform it so that we become healthy again. But if our bubble is connected to somebody else's bubble, we can push it out of our universe into their universe. And then we feel better because we're rid of it. And it's very similar in a way to taking a painkiller or taking a drug or drinking some alcohol. Like, you don't feel it anymore, you're rid of it. Then. But it's very symptomatic. You get rid of the symptoms, but you don't get rid of the cause. Uh, so it's a very bad habit to try to push your energy into other people, but pretty much everybody does it, it's just an instinctive reaction. So you should not feel bad about sending bad energies back to the person where it is coming from, because it's actually a lesson to them. Um, the other thing which happens if we don't deal with energies, so these negative energies keep on existing in ourselves, this imbalance keeps on existing in ourselves. Eventually we will start attracting uh, spirits which feed off those energies. So for instance if I'm saying like, okay, I'm a good person, I don't have any anger, I don't have any aggression, and I'm repressing all my aggression, all my anger all the time, and in a way if I'm successful in that I become unconscious of it. I push it out of my consciousness into a subconscious layer. And the aggression exists, it has an influence on me, but I can no longer see it. And as soon as this happens, I have lost control, and my consciousness can no longer control that part of my being. And it opens it up to control from other spirits. So other spirits can come into that part which is unconscious, because it is unconscious, I don't notice them coming in, slipping into my energy body. And there they start to usually increase that energy, feed off that energy. It's a little bit like a virus, because many viruses, they increase cell growth. So a lot of cells will, will develop, so there will be more food for the virus to feed upon. And in the same way, a spirit will increase my anger, so there will be more anger energy for the spirit to feed upon. And um, such spirits yeah, are called larvae. And they really unbalance us. They're parasites. They, in a way, they absorb our energy, but they also stimulate our energy, but in such a way that it unbalances us. But they're also our teachers because they force us to, because you start having explosions and spasms of anger, which force you to deal with it, force you to recognize there's this power in me and I need to control it. Because if I don't control it, this bad behavior will continue and continue and continue and get worse and worse and worse. So even though they afflict us and harm us, they're also our teachers. And it's the same for most diseases that are indicators of a deeper imbalance. So on the topic of curses, um, that's no longer natural. So in a way, picking up energies from other people or yeah, being vulnerable to infections and even to spirit infections, it's, it's all quite natural. Uh, but a curse is really something which um, requires some effort. Um, so a curse can be seen a little bit like a, like a virus or a computer virus. It's actually a piece of code which is slipped in uh, together and meshes into the normal code. 
and most curses um, are either continual or they have a triggering condition. And the curses which are continual, they tend um, not to work very well or not to work very long because people will compensate for them. So if something is continually pushing you out of balance, then you will become aware of it and you will start to push back and try start to push out the curse. But a uh, curse which has triggering conditions is like a sleeper agent. You don't notice anything until a certain condition has been met and then the curse will activate, it will harm you and then deactivate again. And because it only has a short period of activation, your own energetic immune system is not very likely to, um, to notice it very well. Um, and often curses will have very specific triggering conditions which are determined by the person causing the curse. Uh, so the curse is in a way um, instruction which is not your own instruction. And um, it is made with such a strength or authority that your own energy body listens to it. Um, and there are curses which have to do with health, but most curses have to do with interaction. So you can um, curse a person to become healthy or to become sick, uh, in a way forcing them into a certain condition. Um, but most curses are triggered very specifically, so they make sure a person is always poor, or uh, will never find love, or their relationships will fall apart, or um, they will have accidents. Um, things like this. Or they will attract negative energies. Um, and every curse needs a power source. Um, so curses basically can draw off three types of power source. Um, the first type is basically the person who's casting it. So the person who's casting it can use their own willpower, their own emotion, their own imagination. Um, to create like a battery, uh, an amount of energy, which they um, use to power the curse. And these curses have a limited amount of energy, which tends to run out unless the person who is generating the curse generates new energy. So if they're very actively angry and hating and all the time, then the curse will stay active all the time. But as soon as the person kind of forgets about the person they cursed, then also the curse will deactivate and fall apart. Another option is that the curse is powered by spirits. So uh, the spirits can be summoned by the person who's causing the curse. Um, and these can be both spirits of nature, of elements, uh, of dead people. Um, basically roughly any type of spirit is, uh, is possible. Um, it can also be even guides of the person who ca is casting the curse. Um, and these spirits have uh, the ability to gather energy. They gather energy from their environment uh, to feed themselves and whatever excess energy they have, they can use to feed the curse. So it has like a kind of a, a power, power plant feeding a little bit of energy into the curse continuously. Uh, but the most advanced type of curses, they actually feed off the energy of the person who is cursed. So that the person is fighting himself or herself. So this is very tricky because the more the person is fighting the, cur the curse, the weaker they get because the curse starts drawing in more and more power from them to sustain itself. And this can be an extremely exhaustive yeah, process to try to fight a curse like that. And even fighting it is in itself a curse. Um, so those are very, very tricky conditions uh, people can end up in. Um, so as to what powers are um, used in, uh, in curses and in black magic, um, well there's basically two options if you, um, for a person who's doing this, oh, sorry, three options. One of them is to look inside, because any magic, whether light or dark, can be powered by your own personal skills. You can use your own energy body, you can use your own emotions, you can use your own willpower, your own imagination. 
and by using this you can twist energies and reshape energies. Uh, so if you're using your imagination you can imagine a certain thing happening to a person. So uh, I hope this person has an accident, becomes sick or their relationship falls apart and if ultimately your image becomes strong enough um, then also the lower reality will shape itself to reflect that image and what you wish will happen. Uh, so this is using the imagination. Using the willpower is basically a competition. You want, some, you want one thing to happen, they want something else to happen and if your willpower is stronger then what you want to happen will happen and not what they want to happen will happen. Um, using the empathy is more of a, usually a projection. So I'm feeling pain or sadness or anger or hurt and I want them to feel my pain or my sadness. So I'm in a way sharing my negative emotions or projecting or sending my negative feelings to them or my negative thoughts to them. So for instance, if I'm thinking like, oh God, I want to die and I send these thoughts to the other person, the other person will think, oh God, I want to die and might commit suicide. Um, so these are... Um, methods using your own energy body to create a curse or to empower a curse or to perform black magic. Um, another way, and this is actually the, the method which is used most often, is to use lower energies, lower powers, who have no concept of good or evil. So elemental powers and nature powers. Um, they don't understand what is good or what is evil, they just understand that something is greater than them, higher than them, more complex than they can fathom. Um, so just like we would look at a god or a goddess or an enlightened master, they look up to us. They think like, gosh, there's this higher being and surely it must be wiser than me, it must be better than me. And the best thing I can do is to follow its instructions. Uh, so they're a little bit gullible, if you will. And they can easily be deceived or led to, to serve an evil purpose. But they're in a way also innocent. Uh, they're just doing what they're told uh, without having a real personal interest in or even understanding of what they're doing. Um, and these um, yeah, powers uh, can often be reasoned with. If you can explain them that what they're doing is wrong and there's something better they could do, and if you can show them that you're actually a better or nicer or greater person than the person casting the curse, then they're very likely to rebel and say like, okay, we won't obey this person anymore, we will listen to you and we will stop harming this person because we're sorry and we didn't mean to do that at all. So this is roughly 70% of the curses are of this nature, so they can easily be disarmed by just talking and reasoning with the elemental powers or the nature powers which are involved in it. Um, so the really tricky curses are from this third category. And um, they are using, in a way, powers which are malevolent in nature. Um, or um, using um, a lot of force to coerce higher spirits to do their bidding. Um, so for instance, what a necromancer might do is to trap the spirit of a dead human and not release it, not allow it to move on, to reincarnate uh, until it has performed a certain service for the, uh, for the necromancer. So and this spirit can then be tasked to harm somebody else or to power a curse. And it doesn't really want to, but it sees no other way um, to escape its imprisonment than to obey. It's a slave. It's a slave warrior, in a way. Uh, but you also have uh, spirits who willingly will harm or hinder another person. And these are spirits from the dark side of the cosmos. Um, and there are many greater and lesser powers. Um, there are dark gods, uh, there are dark angels, uh, there are dark enlightened masters. Um, but also there is quite of a, a price in working with the dark cosmos. So 
There are people who do it and they are quite dangerous and quite problematic. But often um, it's, it's kind of like a pyramid game. So you can command powers which are below, below you, but you have to obey powers which are higher than you. So in a way they may have slaves and servants, but in turn they themselves are also a slave or a servant of a higher power. And um, so it's a tricky position to get into this. Because if you're content with just having lower powers to work for you, you can be a master. But um, yeah, for the more difficult tasks, people tend to yeah, uh, reach out for powers which are greater than themselves, which turns them themselves into slaves. So it's a very tricky business to work with them. But yeah, curses of this nature or uh, evil black magicians of this nature, they tend to be very problematic. Um, one very important uh, trump card which you can have in fighting curses like this can be balance. Because even though a person works with the dark cosmos, they are not allowed to disturb the balance of this cosmos. So they cannot create darkness out of nothing. There has to be a balance between light and darkness. And if they disobey, then you can call higher powers, the powers of karma, to intervene. And also if um, a person is given a challenge for which they are ill-prepared, they do not have the strength to overcome the curse, they are trapped eternally because they, there is no way out. This is also disallowed by the gods and higher beings who protect life on this planet. So you can call upon these angels of justice, lords of karma, um, to intervene and to punish the person who has transgressed the, the, the spiritual laws. But people who are yeah, a lot wiser uh, in working with the dark side, they will obey the spiritual laws, but still cause harm. But it is in a way also their right, it's their niche, it's their function within our universe, because there has to be a balance between light and darkness. Um, so you might not be happy with what they do, but they, just like you, have a right to do as they please, as they want. Okay. Um, the next question is, can you explain some techniques to counter these powers? Um, well, yes. Um, there's also a video I have on YouTube. Um, of a workshop I did of uh, uh, the techniques of uh, the spiritual warrior. And the first thing is of course defense, because um, often um, when fighting it is not so much a matter of who strikes the first blow, or but it's a matter of who lasts the longest. And in a battle, in, if you end up fighting, both lose, because both get hurt. So the most important thing is in a way to gain kind of a dominance so that you hurt the other more than they hurt you. And defense is often much more useful to learn than offense because offense can win you the battle but if you're very wounded you will lose the next battle or you will be unable to work for several months. So the first thing to do uh, in energetic combat is to make sure that they don't get a hold of you. And um, basically um, a curse or an uh, energetic attack will work better the more access the person has to your energy body. So the best access, uh, the most perfect access would be to be a lover. Um, because during sex you open up to each other and you are very open, you are very vulnerable. Um, so this is the best method of attack. Um, to have like intimate physical contact with the person you are trying to harm. And this is also why you should always be very cautious. Uh, also because as I explained energy runs from high to low. So even if you have sex without, with another person who doesn't have negative intentions if there is a big difference in, in energy levels, in harmony levels, then your energy will flow yeah, down to their level and they will improve by it, but you will be harmed by it. 
Uh, so it's very important to uh, have a good reciprocal relationship with the persons you're intimate with so that you can really share and both become better of it instead of one of them being sucked dry or harmed by the other person. Well, next to intimate physical contact um, is actually uh, food and drink. Um, we have an aura, which is uh, quite a thick layer of usually a few meters, which is like a, a buffer zone. So energies which come from outside, they get trapped in an aura, they have to fight their way through to affect us. But eat and drink, they don't really pass through our aura because we insert them into our body. And inside our body we don't have such defense mechanisms. We do have chakras inside our body which we can open and close. So it is possible to consume something which has a negative energy and not be harmed by it if you close your chakras beforehand. But usually yeah, our bodies are not trained to do that. We don't feel our food very consciously before we eat it. So most curses, most really strong curses, are actually inserted through food uh, or drink. So it's very important to prepare your own food um, or not to accept food from a person you don't trust. Or even them touching your food um, yeah, can be a way to, to, yeah, to insert an energy which is harmful for you into your food. So even, for instance, chairs and um, uh, touching glasses can be a trap. Uh, so it's something you really need to be cautious of if you're in, in the company of a person who uses black magic, that you're really cautious about your food. So third method is actually using um, something which has an imprint of their energy. So blood, semen, spit, hair, fingernails, um, garments, especially undergarments, um, but also clothes, keys, things like this. Um, because energy is in a way um, harmonic. So even though it is no longer attached to you, so for instance a drop of blood is in a way separated from my body on a physical level, but on an energetical level the energies in this drop of blood and in my body are the same. And because they're connected, they're, there's kind of a harmonic resonance. What happens to my body happens to that drop of blood. And in the same way, if a person has a drop of blood and they affect it in a very negative way, my body will be affected in the same way. So by, in a way, having a lock of hair and cursing it or putting a very negative energy on it and twisting it, the energy of the person will also be twisted or harmed or corrupted somehow. Um, so, yeah, this is a very, um, it's very dangerous to let the person hang on to a part of your energy body. So if you think that this might be happening, then you should recall that energy. Uh, because the drop of blood is a physical object which is holding the energy, but you can, in a way, suck it back out. As I explained also with two people sharing energy, in the same way, um, as my energy can go in the body of my girlfriend, and I can draw it back. You can also draw back energy from garments, from objects you owned, uh, from pieces of your body. You can suck it back to your own body, so that all they have is a piece of material, but not containing any energy anymore. So this prevents this type of, uh, of black magic being used upon you. And this is called sympathetic magic, by the way. Um, so the next way, next powerful way of harming a person is to give them an object. So often people um, will give a metal object, usually some piece of jewelry or even keys to a car or something like this, um, as a gift. Um, usually because metal objects and stones, they can hold a lot of power. And uh, in the same way as uh, food, it in a way bypasses uh, your energetic defenses because it is worn directly on the skin so it can affect the, the physical body uh, and the energetic body directly. Um, usually if you have to do with a curse which is making a person ill it will be through an object or through food. 
but usually objects, because food in a way passes through, it gets digested, it is gone. But if you want to make a person ill, you have to break down the defenses, slowly wither away their life force. And this is often a process which can take many months. So an object which a person carries with them all, all the time is a much more efficient method. Because if you have to feed a person the food regularly, that's quite difficult um, to do. So you can give them a bag of cursed spices and hope they eat them every day, but it's more tricky than giving them a beautiful gift, a beautiful pendant, a ring, earrings, something like this. And uh, this is also the reason why you should never let anybody handle things you wear on your person. You should never let anybody handle your wedding ring or your necklace or whatever because they can put an energy in it which will harm you. Um, so always be very cautious who cleans your clothes, who cleans your jewelry, who has access to them. Um, and in the same way, um, the easiest way if you notice that something is having a bad influence is just to throw it in the river, throw it in the sea, get rid of it somehow. You can also take it to a priest to bless it or to purify it. Um, but this is more tricky and also more risky, especially for the priest because some objects also carry a secondary curse, so they have a primary curse to affect the person who wears it, but they can have a secondary curse so that if a person tries to bless it or to purify it, it will harm the person who's trying to do that. And then by giving it to the priest or whoever to clean it, you will harm them. And it will be another point for the dark side. So getting rid of things, burning them, throwing them in flowing water is usually uh, the best way. Uh, burying them in the earth is not so good. Um, burning is, is would be preferable than water, than putting them in the earth. Uh, because putting them in the earth does prevent the energy from reaching out and harming the person, but the negative energy will stay there and it will eventually draw more negative energies to that location on the planet. Uh, so it will become like a magnet and that will be like a, a small seed which will crystallize more and more negative energies around it. Um, so that's not a very good thing to do. Destruction by fire or purification by water is much better. Um, so then we come to the uh, finally the spirits. So spirits can be sent to uh, reinforce a curse or they can be sent just on their own to harm the person or to disrupt their environment. Um, so for instance, if a person wants to harm me, but I have very good energetic defenses, then such a spirit having its own intelligence might decide like, okay, you know what? I will crawl into the mind of Hanko's boss and get him fired or in Hanko's girlfriend and start a fight with him or Hanko's dog so it will bite him or uh, something like this. And this is basically the great uh, advantage of using a spirit over a curse. A curse is a program which will just do what it is told blindly while uh, a spirit has an intelligence. And the combination between a spirit and a curse is extremely dangerous for this reason. Because a spirit can be used in a way to trigger a curse, to turn it on and off. Um, and this makes it very hard to detect. Um, because detecting curses is a, uh, it's a quite a difficult thing. Um, because a curse has to, in a way, uh, like a parasite, it has to mimic the energy of the of the host. If the energy looks very different, it will be recognized as an alien energy and your own energy body will rid itself of it within a matter of weeks. Um, so the only successful curses are the curses which have a way of hiding within the energy body of the host. And uh, for this reason, they are almost indistinguishable, very hard to find. Um, one way you can use is in a way ask your hosts to change their energy body uh, or work with them to change their energy body and all the energy in the host's body will listen 
uh, to the spirit, commanding it. But not, of course, energies which are from another origin. So uh, spirits which don't belong in the energy body won't listen, curses won't listen, but also energies they pick up from other people, from their environment won't listen. So to find a curse, first you need to do some purification. So you ask the person to meditate, to send back the energies which they picked up from their environment, from other people, to pull back their own energies. Um, you will ask them to meditate further, to become conscious of themselves, to realize themselves, to accept all their thoughts and feelings and emotions so they can get rid of the small spirits who might be stimulating or feeding off their subconscious. And basically once this is done, once this meditation and purification has been done, then you can ask the person, okay, move your energy body or remove or make your aura bigger or smaller. And if you look for spots which don't move along with the rest, then this way you can find curses or spirits which are hurting the person. Spirit can be quite tricky because it can move itself to another dimension. It can leave the energy body of the person and hide in the house or in an object. So if you're looking for a spirit, you should not check just the person, but also the family, the car, the house, um, the place where they work because the spirit can, will often know. So for instance, if I'm cursed or there's a spirit hurting me and I make a phone call to a healer and say like, okay, I will meet you on Sunday. And then the spirit will make sure it is somewhere else on Sunday. It might stay at my work on Friday. And when I come back to, to work on Monday, it will jump on me again. So spirits can be tricky that way. So they require some um, some detective work to track down the traces of a spirit having forced its way into the aura. Um, so often in a way as a spirit enters into the person's energy body they have to dig a tunnel through their defenses. So if you look at the aura very carefully you will see that the person has been attacked in this way, that the spirit has crawled its way through, then you know that there must be a spirit somewhere uh, not necessarily in the aura anymore, but it will be lurking in the environment and should be hunted down and either persuaded not to do that anymore or driven off in some manner. Okay, um, so other ways to protect yourself against these powers. Uh, as I said before, it's a lot about consciousness. If you have control of your own energy body, if you're aware of your own energy body, then you will very quickly detect any attempt to uh, disrupt your, your energy body. Um, the other thing to uh, remember is that the parts of you which have a higher vibration are much more vulnerable than the parts which have a lower vibration. So often um, energetic attacks, also people who are trying to harm you, they will uh, try to um, make contact with sensitive parts of your energy body, so usually the head. So if often the beginning will be to try to block the crown chakra so that you can no longer receive assistance from your ancestors, from your guides, from your prayers, um, uh, so that you're isolated. And, and this is usually the first step in energetic combat, to try to isolate your, your prey. Uh, so they will check the higher chakras first, so the crown chakra and the heart chakra, so that also on a horizontal level you can't receive the support and the love anymore from the people around you, from the people who surround you. So those are generally the, the first places of you which where to expect an attack. And what you can do if such places are attacked is to withdraw in a way your energy body to your lower chakras. So you close your higher chakras down and put all your energy in your belly. And this is also the point of your willpower. So this is where you can create most resistance, where your energy is strongest. And you can just weather the attack and then emerge in a way from your bunker, which is your belly, and then reconquer the rest of your body. Uh, so don't try to fight in these higher chakras um, because um, they're damaged easily. Even if you win the fight there will be a lot of damage to your energy body. Um, so it is uh, very wise in a way to 
Um, don't fight on places which are not to your advantage. So also don't fight if you're in somebody else's house, in somebody else's temple, in front of somebody else's altar, in somebody else's group. Because these are very dis disadvantageous uh, um, yeah, circumstances to initiate a fight. So if you get into trouble in such a location, withdraw to your bunker and take the fight to your place, to uh, your church, to your temple, to in front of your altar where you have the advantage and then start your resistance and clean out the energies which are affecting you. Uh, your best allies are also the beings which have a good view of your energy body. So usually your ancestors, your spirit guides, your power animals, your guardian angels, uh, your light egregores, uh, they can usually give you very good advice or tell you that you're being attacked or warn you that an attack is imminent. Uh, so in my case I'm often informed beforehand uh, that I should go to a church, or I should pray, or I should ask for assistance because an attack is coming. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're then by definition safe, but at least you're a lot better prepared and better able to resist the attack and you have some guidance and some information on what to do and how to counter the attacks. So having allies is also very, uh, very important, very useful. Uh, another very useful technique is, to, is the use of rituals. Because rituals are ways of storing power. Uh, because your own energy body and also your guides can generate X amount of energy at, at a time. And if person has Y amount of energy, so you cannot generate more energy than your enemy. And even your energy combined with the energy of your guides is not strong enough as that of your enemy then you're in a way in a very bad situation. But using a ritual, you can take your own small amount of energy and gather it over many, many days. And bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, you will get the same amount of more energy than your enemy. So using a ritual, uh, which can be done over like one night, one day, or even over a couple of days, you can build up a lot of energy. And uh, this can create very powerful defenses, but also a very powerful healing force or a very powerful um, uh, counterattack. And besides using yourself and your guides in a ritual, you can also ask the assistance of other people um, and also uh, use offerings uh, like food or incense to give more power to your guides or to your guardian angels or to other helpers to help them in the task of assisting you. And uh, the other thing is also that rituals have, um, just like a curse, they have a very, um, they are very rigid. So they have a very specific effect. Uh, so if you do a purification ritual, all energies which don't belong to you will be forced to move out of you, whether they want to or not. And um, because you use a ritual form, you don't have to push all the time with your willpower against it. So using a ritual form is actually, it requires a lot of less effort, a lot of less strength from you. It just requires more patience and more discipline to carry through the ritual in a good way. So rituals are the safest way, in a way, to, uh, to defend yourself. But also for black magicians, they're the easiest and the safest way to build up an, att an attack. So knowledge of rituals is quite, yeah, quite useful. Okay, um, so I have another question here. If somebody puts a curse on somebody else unconsciously, which kind of curse can that be? It's thought that parents have very strong words which can have an impact as a curse on their children. Uh, this is indeed tr very true. Um, so as I said, curses are, are instructions and usually the, the quality of a curse has to do with how much harmony there is in the person doing it. So for instance, um, 
if I'm driving my car and another person cuts me off, uh, then part of me will be angry and will say, ah, you bastard! But other parts of me will not be angry. So there's a small part of me which is angry, but the other part of me doesn't care or understands or is forgiving. And while in me there's this internal struggle, there's also this internal struggle in the energy I send out. So the energy will self-sabotage, will self-destruct by being disharmonious. But if I'm not just a little bit angry, but if I truly believe in something with all my heart, with all my thoughts, with all my desire that something should be so, then this energy is very stable. It's a self-reinforcing instead of self-destructing. And such an energy will continue will carry forth. So, for instance, if I'm just angry at the person and I yell at the person, that's not cursing. Like, the person will feel my negative energy, which I'm projecting to them, but this energy will fall apart in a matter of hours. But if I spend a lot of time, in a way, fantasizing or thinking of what should happen to that person, and I feel what I want them to experience, and I want it, to, to, to work that way and I put really, I harmonize myself and I completely focus all my energy on that thing, then that becomes a curse. So it's very much about focus. Um, and so uh, unconsciously cursing usually means that at least the person has to think a lot or has to consider what they're doing quite a lot. And more or less as a rule of thumb, you can say it three days. So if a person uh, spends about three days thinking about another person, how that person should be, should act, should react, what should happen to them, then the energy becomes strong enough, massive enough and coherent enough to act like a curse. And otherwise the energy will dissipate in a matter of hours or days. Um, so, but um, this is only one part, because once you have this energy, it's still with you, it is not with the person you, who you want to affect. So for this, in a way, internal mindset, internal belief to turn into a curse, it needs to be carried into the other person's energy body. And this can be done in two ways. One of them is that one of your uh, spirit guides or even a spirit guide of the person you're cursing picks up this energy and brings it to the energy body of the other person. Um, so, for instance, if I want to harm somebody, and if one of my spirit cries agrees and says, like, yes, we should harm this person, it can take this energy, take this curse from my energy body and implant it in their energy body. And also it is possible that the person self-curses, so the other person is like, uh, has really done something wrong, and the own spirit guide says, like, yes, my human should be punished for all the evil things she does, then it can actually go out and grab a curse of somebody who's the victim so that the victim will have revenge on their human so that their human will grow and learn not to do that anymore. So this can also happen. But indeed in case of uh, family members this happens quite naturally because as I said the energy bodies are already linked, they're already entwined so the energy can just move from the parent into the child. And um, in general, it moves from, in a way, as I said, the energetic flow is from strong to weak. So it will flow from the stronger person in the relationship to the weaker person in the relationship. And children's energy bodies, they are quite weak. And they really only start to gain strength in their, uh, in their late teens, in their 20s, that the energy bodies become actually more uh, resistant and strong enough to resist impulses which are being projected by the parents. Um, so yes, it is unfortunately possible for parents to curse their children. And often they do it with the best intentions. Um, and often this is a projection, like they have done something wrong in their lives and they want to prevent their children from doing the same, not realizing that their children have a different path to walk and that they're actually, in a way, limiting their options and limiting the path uh, they can walk. And every limitation, in a way, every rule, is a form of aggression. 
but in some cases it is um, the lesser of two evils. So any restriction is an evil, but for instance if you say to a person like, okay, um, you can't use drugs, yes, you're limiting their options, you're limiting their freedom, which is bad. But if the person is very irresponsible and they do use drugs, it would be worse. And it's the same way with upbringing. So in the beginning when a child is young they need a lot of rules, but as they mature the amount of rules should diminish and more and more freedom should be allowed to the person as much as they can handle. But curses being yeah, in a way inflexible, they tend to be the same. They tend not to grow. Um, so you don't really outgrow uh, a pattern which is implanted uh, in you by your parents if this is indeed like a curse. Um, so one thing you can do is of course to try to give it back to your parent if they're still alive. Um, another thing you can do is try to get some life force from the parent to resolve the curse. So for instance if I'm suffering from a pattern which was implanted into me by my mother I could take a small snippet of life force from my mother and bring it into contact with this curse. And if my mother has changed her mind, then in a way the curse, because it is still her energy, will transform itself to correspond to her current state. So if she no longer has that belief, then the uh, left behind part will transform. So in a way it's like an update, it's like, okay, no, I no longer believe that. So no, this curse no longer needs to apply. And this force or this influence on my son no longer needs to apply. So this is a very gentle way to deprogram people from yeah, mistakes their parents may have made in their youth and which their parents have outgrown. Um, it is also possible to use more neutral life force to transform these curses. Um, so often um, by using in a way nature spirits you can ask them to give you an amount of life force, an amount of energy, which you can use to transform this energy, to transform this curse. And the nature spirits being friendly and helpful yeah, by nature <laughs> will gladly do so and they can in a way synthesize an energy very like the life force of the person. And this is especially useful if the person has already dis yeah, passed on, is deceased, if the person is unwilling to change their mind. You can use this synthetic life force with your own instructions also to remove a curse which is implanted on this subconscious, almost accidental level. A very good question, thank you. Yes, um, working with curses is indeed quite complicated. It's, it's really a, a specialty, much more difficult than normal energetic healing. Um, especially because um, curses often are booby-trapped. So uh, the most simple booby trap is basically a watcher spirit. So if the curse is removed, a spirit will run back to the person who created the curse to inform them like, okay, somebody removed the curse. So the person knows that the curse has been broken and can re-implant it. And will often also try to prevent the person who removed the curse from removing it again, so often then it will curse also the person who does the removal of the curse. So removing curses is actually quite a dangerous business um, because people pay very well for curses. Cursing is really where the money is to be made in the, in the spiritual world and curses often cost like up to 5,000 euros. Two to 5,000 euros is a normal price for a very good curse. So. And yeah, the person who performs these, uh, these curses and does these rituals, have, they have a reputation to uphold. Because people won't just give them loads of money without getting their results. So these people are, tend to be very tenacious and trying to help somebody who is cursed can, be, can result in a spiritual battle which can last months or even years. Uh, because they have a lot at stake. So it's a very tricky business uh, to get involved in, but unfortunately it's also a very necessary business to get involved in, because curses are some of the worst things which can happen to a person's life path, to a person's spiritual growth. Um, 
one of the safest things to do, ways to deal with the curse is in a way to disarm it. Um, because most curses are blind, they in a way have to, uh, they're connected to the energy body of the person who's cursed and you look for certain triggering conditions. Do they have money? Do they have a girlfriend? Are they traveling? Are they happy? Are they healthy? And if so, then the curse triggers. And one of the easiest ways to do is to, in a way, to fool the curse so that it doesn't make contact with the real energy body anymore, but makes contact with an illusionary energy body. So that the curse thinks, oh yeah, the person is doing horrible, I don't need to do anything because the person is cursed, but the person is not actually suffering from the curse anymore. Um, so you blind the curse. Um, but yeah, the trickiest form is usually when people use a mix, so they use both spirits and the curse, because the spirits are yeah, the really capable people. They have spirits who have to report back every few months or every few years, and when they don't show up, then they know that something happened. And sometimes you can try to reprogram the spirit or exchange the spirit. So you send away the bad spirit, ask a good spirit to more or less fake itself, to pretend to be an evil spirit who's upholding the curse. But yeah, it, it gets very, very complicated. Um, it's really um, a business for people who are really into spiritual warfare to, to work with curses. Um, also, uh, another method which is often used to, uh, to deal with curses is to move them from one body to another. Um, it's not the nicest thing to do, but it is one of the easiest things to do. So, what they will do, for instance, um, I have a curse. I go to a person to, who is willing to help me and they will take usually a chicken and they will move the curse from my energy body to the energy body of the chicken and then um, to uh, uh, prevent the chicken from yeah, suffering or anybody from finding out uh, they will kill the chicken and thereby the energy the curse will lose its source of power its source of energy and also the mission of the spirits will be fulfilled because the person has been finished off by the curse so then yeah, the uh, person who cast the curse doesn't know that anything has ended, but unfortunately you will have killed and cursed an innocent chicken. Um, it can be done with other animals as well. Uh, some animals are even uh, willing to accept curses and will willingly sacrifice themselves for their humans. Um, I've had that happen to me, uh, actually, that also a person and a very negative energy to me and one of my pets sacrificed itself and died uh, but yeah this is it works it works very well but yeah it requires a sacrifice and if it's a willing sacrifice that's one thing it's very sad but good if it's an unwilling sacrifice it's actually also a negative act but it can be a less negative act than allowing the person to continue to suffer. So what is worse, a chicken suffering for five minutes before you kill it, or a person suffering for many years. So yes, it's the lesser of two evils, but it is still an evil. Um, so yeah, it's a very tricky business. And um, also another problem is that um, in a way you use a very different part of the cosmos very different powers who teach these powers who teach these rituals and uh, the more you study it the more you know about it uh, the more in a way your energy is going to vibrate or to connect to that part of, of existence so you in a way by studying it even studying it to fight it you become it more and more and more uh, so like Nietzsche said, uh, when fighting monsters you should beware of becoming one. And this is definitely one of the dangers of learning how to deal with black magic, how learning how to deal with curses. So you should always try to minimize the knowledge you have. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope to, uh, to study these things. Um, but unfortunately ignorance is also not a perfect protection either. <laughs> So, yeah. Yes, 
And thank you for listening. Okay, I hope we can have a more positive topic to talk about next week. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.